Welcome to the Irishman, Englishman and Scotsman football podcast. Alex Ferguson, what was he like to, to play for and what kind of relationship did you have with him? Yeah, it was a lot different. From, from a young kid, it, it was far more simpler. Uh, because as a young kid, it was just basically, you know, just a yes sir, no sir. Uh, yes boss, no boss, you know. Um, you kept your mouth quiet and you sort of stayed in the background and so forth. Um, a lot different than when I came back. Obviously, when I came back, it was, you know, I was on a lot of money. There's no doubt I came on a free transfer. And uh, the expectations of the club uh, were, I would say, a little bit different. The club had changed. They had that success that they always were yearning for. Uh, and he changed, and I changed as well. Uh, maybe I, maybe looking back, I didn't quite realise that. Maybe he didn't quite realise that. Because maybe he viewed me as that young boy from Australia um, who would just go, OK, no worries, where I wasn't. You know, it, it, it wasn't, you know, the Mark Bosses then, when I came back, wasn't just straight away, OK, it was like, well, all right, but, you know, tell me why. And, you know, he'd be like, what do you mean tell me why? I'm telling you because I'm your boss. So, you know what I mean? It's a little bit different. So, um, but, I mean, you're, I, you're uh, coming back as Mark Bosnich International, who's got two League Cup medals in your back pocket. Yeah, you're not yeah but, kid, also, so. but also you've got to remember as well, I'm coming back to a manager who's just been knighted um, and who just won the treble. So you can imagine the type of, you know, the, you know, uh, had the type of power that he was feeling within himself as well, which is fine. But I was like, w whatever. Um, but any type of uh, discrepancy or doubt that was put against him, from my perspective, about anything, not just about football, whatever, about anything, was sort of looked upon as like, you know, sort of a little bit. I could tell from he changed. Put it that way. I think he was less understanding than he was way back when I was first a young kid. But then he'd probably turn around and say, "Well, I was completely different as well." So that's completely understandable. Um, but. In terms of manager, I mean, he, he'll go down as one of the greatest managers of all time. There's no doubt about that. Um, ph phenomenal success ratio. Um, a very, very good at spotting a player. Uh, was ruthless when he needed to be. Um, you know, he knew his deficiencies and, and he would, you know, he would cover them by hiring people to, to make sure um, that, that, that those deficiencies would be taken care of. And, uh, and very, very good, you have to say, overall, at managing a squad of, of, of real winners, of big players. That's not easy at all because, you know, when you've got big players, 11 players will be happy on the weekend. The other, the other you know, six or seven will not be for not playing. But you're going to need those other six or seven if you're going to be truly successful because the amount of games you're going to have. And I think, you know, the fact that he, you know, that he uh, clapped on very, very quickly. And that was advice I think he'd got from the likes of Marcello Lippi and a few others, you know, you know, during the 90s of, you know, the fact that we played so many games in England, it was very, very difficult, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for any top team to play one side in all three or four competitions. Yeah. And he clapped onto that. And he also realized as well at that time, the spending power of the top clubs in Spain and, and Italy was still well above the, the, the spending power of, of the Premier League clubs. Although that's changed and it did start to change. But the fact that he could, you know, that, like for example, buying Dwight York, Andy Cole, and having Teddy Sheringham and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Look how vital that proved in the end. Because without, you know, sort of seeing that and having that vision to say, okay, well, Maybe I, you know, I can't have the, the, the very, very best at this moment in time. Maybe I can't have a Ronaldo, for example, the original Ronaldo. But what I'll do is I'll get four world-class strikers and I'll have, you know, I'll keep them happy the way I'll manage them. And in the end, look, at how, look what happened. You know, it was Teddy Sherry, Molly Gunnar Solskjaer, uh, who scored those two vital goals Champions that League, might yeah. in Barcelona in the Champions League. So um, you, you have to, like I said, for, for that, for me, I think that was, that, that was very adaptable. And for me, adaptability is a mark of a genius. There's no doubt about that. The other thing you have to say when you come down to the ruthlessness, you know, you know, he, he, you could tell that he had a, well, basically, if he didn't change the team, I think he realized that maybe he may get changed. So, he, you know, he very much adapted very, very well to each era. He realized a lot of times when players' time was going to be up and he usually sort of moved them on before that. Uh, and you could see, you know, had those, you know, that, that obviously the treble winning team, the original team that first broke the duck and, and won. You know, but the, the, the big aim was always Europe. And then he had that other team with, you know, Carlos Tevez, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, Berbatov, uh, Wayne Rooney. So he was very, very good at that. There's no doubt at rejuvenating that squad. And he did it, you know, like I said, during good times, yes, in terms of the money he could spend, but also during times when 
money was a little bit, you know, not as not as free flowing as it perhaps been in the past for him. I mean, there's no doubting he's an absolute genius of a manager and probably will mm. go down as the greatest Premier League manager of all time. Like, and you're mm. right though. Thinking back, I mean, I obviously was a I'm a big Newcastle fan. That team, yeah. you know, Newcastle obviously would have had Shearer and Ferdinand. But uh, for example, Andy Cole was sold for Ferdinand to come in. That that Man United team were, were the real, you know, the original team to bring in four world class strikers into the Premier League mm. and then rotation, rotation, rotation. Mm. But would you say that during the, the latter years, um, I mean, when, obviously when you were there, you know, was he, I mean, players seem to be kind of gone without much of a, an argument like Beckham went, Yaf well, Sam, yeah, well, that's, Yeah, well, that's, that's, what, that's why I tried to sort of, sort of uh, say in terms of him being ruthless and getting rid of players, you know, just on the whim. And when you when you had started having that type of success that he did have, um, it was far easier for him to do that. Um, but it must be said, whether or not he get, got, you know, whoever it was he got rid of, whether it be Beckham or Yap Stam, Roy Keane, whatever, um, pretty much you have to look then either the season after or the season after that, um, they had success. So he could always go back to the board and say, well, look, look, you know, however much time, um, but let's not forget as well the fact that the board originally, you know, when I was there the first time, there were times, JP, and I remember this um, probably what was about four months before they won that first FA Cup where the crowd basically, I'd say about, and they'd actually ironically played Crystal Palace that day and they'd lost. And he left Mark Hughes on the bench and half a K stand, which was in the far corner of the ground. So if the strep for was to your left, that was in the far corner where you could still stand up. Because he left Mark Hughes on the bench, they all sat down in protest and he lost 2-1 and I reckon out of the 50,000 that were there that day or whatever it was, I reckon at least half the crowd stayed back and clawed for his head. There were people coming down the training ground and the board, in my opinion, Martin Edwards and co and Sir Bobby Charlton and Morris Watkins and all, all that deserve a lot of credit for standing by him because it was the easiest thing at that time would have been to let him go and they stood by him and, um, and whether or not it was a bit of a result of that or not, but then obviously when he had the success, you know, but a lot of people like that too. You know, when you have a great, great deal of success, you know, some, you know, sometimes you, 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 you think that you've got that, which he, you know, which he did have at that time, that type of power. But to be fair to him, even after those departures, he eventually replaced somebody or they eventually, and how did they do that? The best way was by winning. There's no doubt about that. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously towards the end, his greatest challenge and one really that hasn't been met even after his left, was Manchester City. Uh, and the fact that, you know, during the time, uh, you know, when he's with the Glazers, he had to deal with the fact that obviously they couldn't be as free spending in the past because of the debt that they had to service each year. The fact that they did win, you know, they still won titles when he got Van Persie and all that is, is a testament to his management. You have to say that, no doubt about that. Because Manchester City, as we've seen both then and now, uh, are not no noisy neighbours. Um, they are... Um, they are top neighbours, put it that way. Uh, they've, uh, they've they've built a house that's equivalent to Man United and gone above it too in terms of the success of the football club. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, so far as Manchester City are concerned, um, you know, the, the, the final bit on, on their cake will be to start dominating in Europe as well. And they've got a wonderful opportunity to do that this season. At the clubs you were at, was there always clashes between international managers with players and club managers? You couldn't win, put it that way, because if you went to Australia, uh, the club managers would always get really upset. If you got injured, God forbid. I got injured once when I was at Man United, Fergie wouldn't talk to me for a couple of weeks. You said you were injured and Fergie wouldn't talk to you for weeks. Would, would he do that with every player or was it just you? Oh, no, I think he's done even worse. I mean, speak to the likes of Neil Webb and people like that who, you know, who was one of his favourites. Then he went to an England trip and, and, and got injured and sort of fell out completely with him. So... Um, he was just basically one of them, you know, you can ask any of the players who were there. That's you know, Ryan Giggs would have had the same situation with Wales. Very, very rarely he was like, you're not going, you're not going, simple as that. Which you can understand, you know, his priority was Manchester United. So, especially when you had some of these matches were just friendlies or, you know what I mean? Um, thankfully now there's, there's a lot of cohesion and harmony with the international calendar. Because international football is important, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but that was a time when it was a little bit more Wild West, so to speak. Um, and uh, and like I said to you, so far as I was concerned, my priority, number one priority, was my club, my employers. So, um, you know, and, and it was I used to try to explain it to people over here who could never really quite see that, but uh, it, it's difficult because this is my living, this is what I do, you know, and I don't, I'm scared to lose my place or to go back and to turn around and them saying, look, see you later. If you want to go play for Australia all the time, we'll get get somebody else. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to hear more of our podcasts, 
please click on the red subscribe button on the bottom right hand side. Thank you.